Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another amazing night in our Ask Our Expert series. Before we get started, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. As we go through tonight's presentation, I'm inviting everyone to keep yourselves muted. At around the 7.30 mark, we will pause after the presentation. We will pause and take up any questions that the audience may have. At that time, you can either unmute yourself you can submit your questions through the chat um, and we'll take it up or you can unmute yourself and um, we'll give you a chance to ask your question live. We also have some pre-submitted questions that we will take up at the end of um, the presentation as well. For any reason uh, we don't get through the questions, we will make sure that we take note of it and send these to you by email. Of course, the questions will also be posted on our website for any that we haven't um, we didn't get a chance to answer in tonight's session. So without further delay, let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alethea O'Hara Stevenson, president and founder of the Dufferin County Canadian Black Association. The association was established um, just over a year ago. So we've hit the one year milestone, which is a major accomplishment for us. The association, of course, was a start, it's a nonprofit association, and our mission is to demonstrate leadership, advocacy, provide relevant education, resources, and training to enhance and elevate the Black communities in Dufferin County. Of course, on tonight's call, we have um, our DCCBA team, including Jordan Stevenson, who is on the call. We also have some amazing um, guests who have return guests um, who are joining us again tonight, Velma Morgan from Operation Black Vote. We also have Josh McEwen from Duffer News, Minerva Sada from Queen One Consulting. So another huge um, support we have tonight from some very um, regular and supportive members. At this time, it is my honor to introduce our guest tonight. Our session, of course, is on the nuts and bolts of municipal politics. And as you all know, um, the next municipal election is coming up just around the corner next year. So it is my honor to introduce our very own deputy mayor for the town of Shelburne. Now, I have to read his full bio because his credentials is quite impressive. So just bear with me. Steve was appointed to council on October 2nd in 2017. After the, past, after the passing of um, a councillor in the town of Shelburne. The town held an open and competitive appointment process and Steve was chosen to be the successful candidate. Following Steve's appointment, Shelburne Mayor Ken Bennington was quoted as saying, he just seemed to be the most prepared, the most confident. He had some great ideas for inclusion in our diverse community. He was just a step above the rest. Steve is also a practicing lawyer for over 13 years with the Toronto Transit Commission, where he has received a number of awards for his distinguished service. He has extensive community board experience, serving as a former vice president for the Ontario College, College of Kinesiology, board member with, the, with prologue to the performing arts, citizen appointment for community care access center, and a citizen appointment for the city of Brampton task force. Steve has also been recognized as one of the top 50 Jamaicans in the GTA in 2013. He has also been the recipient of, um, acknowledged as by the House of Commons for his community service also in 2013. Steve is of course a firm believer in family and the proud father of two children. On October 22nd, he was elected as a deputy mayor for the town of Shelburne and was sworn in in December 2018. What is not on this bio is Steve's um, passion for community. He has initiated a number of initiatives in the town of Shelburne as well as um, Dufferin County where he serves as a counselor to recognize and drive for the cause of diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, most notably, uh, Steve also put forward a motion to establish the um, Anti-Black Racism Task Force in the town of Shelburne last year, which has um, gained significant traction and momentum where other municipalities have since reached out to um, get copies of the blueprint that was um, created. 
What is also not on this um, bio is the fact that Steve is soon to be an upcoming uh, published author. Um, and I don't want to steal the thunder, but we will definitely talk a little bit more about his uh, soon to be released book that um, is coming out this year. So without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, please help me give Deputy Mayor Steve Anderson a virtual uh, welcome. Deputy Mayor Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Alethea, uh, for providing this uh, platform this evening uh, for what I hope is an engaging uh, conversation. And certainly I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, everyone here this evening for taking the time. I'm sure you could be doing something else. And so we certainly appreciate uh, you tuning in this evening. You know, the, the other thing that is uh, missing from the, uh, the bio as Alethea talks about all the accomplishments is really uh, the community's support uh, in allowing me to achieve those accomplishments. Uh, I think sometimes when we hear all these um, recognitions or accomplishments or achievements, um, we tend to believe that maybe we achieved this on our own. Uh, and it was certainly because of many people in the community as to why I'm able to sit in this position today. And so as we talk about the nuts and bolts of municipal politics, um, for those who are, are interested in running, whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, uh, you will soon come to see that without the support of the community, no matter how good your intentions are, your initiatives, your goals, and your plans, uh, they will go nowhere if the community is not behind you. So that's important. I certainly want to mention that uh, as well. Um, we have uh, a slide or a couple of slides that I put together, a slide deck. Uh, it's not long. The purpose is really just to go through some key things, uh, just to get people, again, who are thinking about uh, running. Uh, sort of turn their mind to important points or factors that they should be considering. Uh, and then what I want to do is leave enough time for, as I mentioned before, for this to be as engaging as possible so that if you have any specific questions, I'm certainly happy to, uh, to take it. I, I must say, as we're preparing for the slides, that I've had the good fortune to do a number of these presentations. Uh, I was lucky enough to do one last week, I believe, or the week before that uh, with some good folks in Guelph, and I believe I see one or two individuals from that presentation that are on uh, today, and that's good to see. Um, and it's very rewarding to be able to share your experience and your knowledge with those who are interested in getting into the public forum. Um, and so that's that's something that's near uh, and dear to me. So again, I hope that uh, you are uh, a blessed, and certainly if you have questions, feel free uh, to ask. So if you could turn to the slide, please, Abithia. So we're at the, uh, the bottom of the slide. We'll get to the top portion. Here we are running for municipal council. And that's, that's yours truly, uh, putting out uh, my sign on a hot day, I must say. Uh, but that's part of the process. If we could just move on. So as we talk about um, representation and representation matters, we hear a lot about that uh, in words. And we'll see it on Instagram. And you know, politicians say that. Uh, you have community advocates that say that. Uh, but it's more than words, it's really action, and it really does mean something. So as I was talking about um, how I'm really proud to engage in these kinds of forward, forums and sort of paying it forward, um, I do that because A, knowledge is power, but B, uh, more importantly or equally as important is the fact that representation matters. So when people are able to see themselves uh, in individuals that... Um, that may inspire them, that may come from a, a similar background, that again helps in their decision-making as to whether or not they wanna move forward. Uh, and that takes me into a perfect sort of transition to uh, this article that was done by the daughter of one of our community members, uh, Amira Ali, uh, on this very point about representation and why it matters. And so the article was entitled, and I was fortunate enough to be interviewed for this piece, it's mentors for aspiring racialized politicians are in short supply. Uh, so for those who are running and eventually get into office, uh, you'll see how great the responsibility is, not obviously to serve your community, but to, again, to pay it forward and to encourage and inspire others. And so they interviewed a number of politicians. You're looking at uh, um, uh, liberal uh, MP in the area in Mississauga, uh, I believe. Yes, Mississauga MP Khalid. And here's her response. And I see Ian just joined. Ian, thanks for coming in. It says, a large number of people question my capability to lead since I'm young, Muslim woman of color, even though I'm just like every other middle class. 
uh, every, every middle class Canadian, uh, says Khalid, who represents Mississauga Air Mills, an ethnically diverse riding just west of Toronto. It goes on to say, aspiring BIPOC politicians face many hurdles from a lack of financial resources to discrimination at the ballot box, making it hard for them to stay motivated. But one of the most significant impediments is the shortage of BIPOC mentors in Canadian politics, say many BIPOC politicians. And I know that Belma's on from Operation Black Vote. I'm sure uh, she could speak uh, to that as well as to the maybe the lack of mentors. Uh, and certainly that's growing. Uh, but certainly how significant it uh, is to have mentors that you could turn to. You know, getting into public office is probably one of the biggest decisions you're going to make in your life if you're deciding to uh, to run. You know, it's I think anytime you decide to come out of your comfort zone, it's always challenging. Um, but public office is another beast onto itself. And so to be able to speak to somebody that has already gone through the process, somebody that you could identify uh, is very important in allowing you to make that decision with confidence and not with fear. Um, it says in 2019, only 17.8% of MPs belonged to a visible minority, even though at the time of the 2016 federal census, more than 25% of Canadians were racialized, a number that is likely much higher today. I think we all could agree with that. And it says, nevertheless, 60% of seats in parliament are held by people who are not BIPOC. And it goes on to say, BIPOC lawmakers say, helping aspiring politicians of color find mentors who look like them would help to even out the imbalance. And I think many of us uh, who fall into that category would certainly agree. And this is one of the things when you're doing things virtually online, folks, uh, the ring lights that you get, pay attention to that because they generate a lot of heat. And they, <laughs> for me, it sometimes causes a problem. But in any event, uh, to the next slide, please. So have courage and conviction. If you're thinking about running for uh, public office, again, whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, the question that you have to ask yourself is why are you running to begin with, right? That you, you have to have a reason as to why are you seeking to put yourself out there to gather the support of the community? Why are you running? And if you're running for the wrong reasons, I would submit to you that as soon as adversity comes your way, as soon as the resistance, and there will be resistance, that comes your way. Uh, if you're not firmly rooted in the purpose of why you are running, that will, uh, I assure you, will dissuade you from wanting to move forward in public office. So know why you're running. Uh, is it a matter of principle? Is it a matter because it's in the family? Is it that something that has happened in the community where you say, you know what, it's time for me to stand up and be accounted for? Know why you're running. Um, the second point I have here is, what are you bringing to the table? So you've decided to run, but what skill set, um, what talents are you bringing to the table to help better position yourself and obviously position the community? So, for example, is it I'm a great public speaker? Is it that um, I, I'm great in leadership? Uh, I know how to uh, bring people together, right? So what skill set are you bringing to the table? And let me assure you, when you go door to door, where you're doing debates, uh, this very same question is going to be asked of you and you should be able to have a response. The third point here is, are you mentally prepared for the challenges that will come your way? Uh, there is no question when you go into public office that challenges will come your way. There are challenges that are universal to everybody when you get into politics, you know, the fear of public speaking, uh, am I able to get my message across? Uh, you know, can I run a, a successful campaign? These are all things that are universal to anybody who decides to step into this forum. But there are other factors that come into play for other candidates. Uh, you know, we talked about BIPOC candidates, and we'll just look at the next bullet point here uh, as to other factors that some people have to consider. Uh, it says many Canadians aren't ready for racialized people to be in power, according to the 2015 book by Aaron Tolley Frame Media, and that coverage of race in Canadian politics. And the book cites a survey conducted by the Center for Research and Information on Canada that found that 79% of Canadians said that they would not or would be less likely to vote for a party if its leader was Black, 78% if the leader was Jewish, 71 if the leader was Indigenous, and 63% uh, of if the leader was Muslim. Well, all we have to do is look at some of uh, the 
the vitriol that has been uh, levied against uh, Jagmeet uh, Singh, the leader of the, the NDP. Um, and somebody asking, well, Steve, this is the nuts and bolts of politics. Why are we bringing race into this? Isn't this simply us talking about, you know, how one gets into politics and sort of what to expect? Yes, it's all of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd be remiss not to talk about some of the issues that some people will have to face. And it's not that we should look at these issues and these concerns as um, something that should dissuade us, but we certainly should be prepared mentally to be able to address these challenges and to be able to move on and still obtain um, success. And even though these were challenges speaking personally, some of which I faced, uh, what you're relying on, what you're counting on, despite some of these issues that may arise, what you're counting on is that the majority of the community is going to see you for what you are, which is a person of substance. And so for fortunately for me, even though there was a minority of individuals where I received some of this backlash or some criticism or uh, questions as to whether or not I was competent and capable, uh, I was able to garner the support of the majority of the community who was forward thinking and accepting that, yes, a black man coming from Toronto into a town of Shelburne could lead as deputy mayor. And so if I could do it here in Shelburne, I'm confident that wherever you are, you could do it as well. Next slide, please. Know the issues, know your candidates. So the first point I have here is, do you know uh, the important issues in your community? Well, you can't be looking to get into public office if you have no idea of what the issues are in your community. So once you decide why you're running, what you bring to the table, it's important to inform yourself as to what the issues are and how you're going to go about resolving those issues. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the next point here is know the strengths and weaknesses of your competition. Uh, if you're running for municipal council, for example, well, there's a number of individuals that we refer to as incumbents, incumbent councillors, a mayor and a deputy mayor that have been serving for four years. And so if you're looking to buy for one of those positions, you need to ask yourself, how are you different um, than the people that are currently in power? And that takes us to the next point. How is it that you're going to distinguish yourself? Well, the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you know the track record of those who are currently in power, the things that they've done well, and maybe the things that they haven't done so well, and how you're going to position yourself to say that if X wasn't done well over the last four years, how you're going to come in bringing your skill set, your vision to make the community better. And that ties perfectly into the next bullet point here, which is what is your message at the end of the day? Uh, you could be the best looking, you could have money in your pocket, uh, you could be super tall, you could have a family name. At the end of the day, not to say that those things don't help you, um, we've seen in different parts of the world how that could uh, play into politics. But if you're running this properly, it is about your message. And despite if, whether you're a BIPOC candidate or you're not, at the end of the day, what is really going to resonate with the majority of your community is your message. Could the community embrace your message and your vision for the community to make it better for all people? And I think if you're able to do that and stay on course with that, many of the, the, the challenges along the way, you'll be able to withstand that. Next slide, please. So here is the Municipal Elections Act. There's a couple of references that I, I have here just for uh, for you to turn your mind to. But this is the legislation that governs if you're looking to get into municipal politics. And so this is something that if you're considering even now for next year, we, we still have some time, but I would encourage you to look at it and familiarize yourself with the act itself, because this is what's going to govern your conduct, right? The things that you can do, the things that you can't do. And so you don't have to have it memorized, but you certainly wanna have a working knowledge uh, of the act and certainly have it available, easily available and accessible to you. So when you need to make reference to it, uh, then you can, because the last thing you want to do is invest all this time to become a candidate and then make a number of missteps that potentially could get you disqualified. So here are a couple of things that I have noted here pertaining to the act that I found interesting as I went through uh, my own uh, nomination and, and candidacy. So one is who can be nominated and section 29 speaks to that. Right? Are you 18 years of age? Are you a resident in the community that you're seeking to serve? Uh, Section 33 talks about endorsement of nominations. I'm not sure if everybody understands what that means, but 
it's it's one thing to file your application and pay your fee to say that you want to run uh, for uh, leadership in your community, but in for, for municipal elections and maybe those who are here that may have more provincial and federal knowledge, I can only speak to municipal, but you then have to then get 25 signatures for uh, of individuals in your community that support your application. And so, of course, prior to that, you want to be someone who has good relations, uh, certainly is a person who speaks to members in their community, um, somebody that the people in the community trust. And so now when you go with your nomination papers to say, hey, listen, can I get 25 people? And hopefully this is not all your family, uh, that there are 25 people in your community that are willing to say, yes, I want Steve, I want Alethea, I want Velma, I want whoever uh, to take this leadership role. Uh, you see section 28 that says voters list. This is very important. Again, when I was starting off in this process, I, I didn't have any idea what uh, that was at least until later on, I got an email from uh, the town clerk that said, listen, you have access to a voters list of eligible voters that are in your area, which is very important as we're talking about targeting resources because running a campaign can be expensive. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're allocating resources and you're targeting people in your community who are eligible to vote. Uh, and then section 88.1 of the act talks about uh, access to resi residential premises. You know, could you go deliver your flyer in a condo uh, uh, building versus a non-for-profit, et cetera. So all this here speaks to your ability and your rights to do that. Because you may go into a place and a landlord may wanna stop you and say, well, sorry, we don't take solicitation here. But if you know what your rights are, you're able to respond to that person in a way that uh, protects and preserves your rights under the act. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what we have here, this looks a bit uh, jumbled, and I apologize for that, but these are important dates to know as the elections, you know, we, we think it's far away before you know it, it's here. And so again, I encourage those who are looking to uh, get involved into public office, certainly at a municipal level, to really start paying attention to the dates, the legislation, and all the things that we talked about or I talked about uh, at the very beginning. So May 2nd, uh, here is when you're able to first file your nomination uh, papers. So whether you want to run for councillor, uh, deputy mayor, uh, mayor, et cetera, here's the opportunity where you're able to, uh, to do that. Um, the next date I see here is Friday, August the 19th. Uh, this is the deadline for candidates to file nomination, withdraw nomination. Uh, yes, there are people who actually file and then withdraw. Uh, because maybe the breadth of what they have to do is starting to sink in and they're kind of like, whoa, this is not for me. Uh, this is more than I thought and, and, and I wanna remove my name. And so that does happen. And that gets back to my earlier point about why are you running? Because the moment the light, the stroke light comes on, if you're not firm in the reasons as to why you're running, you might be one of these individuals that as soon as you file, you're in the next week or two, you're looking to withdraw. Um, August 22nd is the last day for the clerk to certify the nomination papers. Uh, and so once it's all in, that day comes, they certify it, and those are the candidates that are going to be campaigning, seeking for the office, to obtain the office that um, they are looking for. Uh, September 1st, again, I talked about that voters list. If you are running for municipal politics, you want to make sure you get your hands on the voters list. You want to make sure you want to do that. You want to make sure that you are targeting eligible voters. So, for example, if you're looking to do a mail drop, well, you don't want to do a mail drop to residents where in your community that are not eligible to vote because that would be a waste of resources and resources are not in an abundance for most people. And so you want to make sure that you have that list and that you're targeting the people that you want to target. Uh, September 23rd. Uh, speaks to um, spending limits. Uh, that's very important. How much could you contribute to your campaign? How much could a third party contribute to your campaign? Those are all important. And you want to make sure that you're not in violation of those rules, because once again, that could get you disqualified. Um, uh, October 21st, it says it's the last day to register as a third party advertiser. And then obviously, it's D-Day, right? which is election day. And this is where you're at home, you're with your family, you're in a bar. I don't know where you are, but I'm telling you, you're biting your nails. That's what you're doing. Uh, because 
at this point, it is all out of your hands. You would have done the grueling campaign. You would have knocked on doors. You would have done the mail drops. You would have done debates. Uh, you would have done all that you could to put yourself in a position to succeed. And now election day is where you sit back and see whether the community as a whole has embraced your message and has put the confidence in you to lead them for the next four years. Next slide, please. Um, talked about October 24th, which is D-Day. Um, the October 25th is when the results will be, I guess, certified and declared. Uh, and you'll see this all over the news. Uh, usually there's news uh, channels that are covering, watching the votes as they come in. And again, you're sitting there, uh, probably have your phone on mute because you don't want to take any calls. Uh, and certainly you'll take it off of mute if you're successful, but certainly if you're not, it'll probably be on mute for quite some time. Uh, then October 22nd, or 27th rather, is the removal of your election signs. You saw at the beginning of my presentation me putting my election signs in the graphs. Well, there's a time to do that, and there's a time to have them removed. And so this speaks to when you eventually have to collect them. If you don't, uh, somebody in your municipality may come and remove them, and there might be a fee or a fine that you may have to pay if they have to come and collect it on your behalf. It's a bad look anyways. You don't want to do that. The election is over. You want to make it a point to remove your signs. And quite frankly, you paid for them too, and you don't want them to be destroyed or discarded unnecessarily. Uh, and then November 15, 2022, it talks about terms of office, et cetera, et cetera. And then March 31st, 2023, deadline for filing financial statements. This is very important. And what we're talking about here is what you've contributed to your campaign, any third parties that contribute to your campaign, any donations that you got to your campaign. There are financial statements that you have to prepare and submit. And once again, that if you're not doing this properly, this potentially, after all that work that I talked about that you've done to get to this point, you potentially could be disqualified from office uh, if your statements are in disarray or you have breached the rules. Next slide, please. Conclusion. Um, it says, stay committed to making a difference. I mean, once you get in, God bless you, man. Like it's a major achievement to be able to, again, get out of your comfort zone, go before your community and have your community say, yes, I want you to represent us for the next four years. Stay committed to making a difference. Sometimes we get into these positions and we lose sight of why we got there. And we start doing things that are inconsistent with what we told the people that we were going to do. Uh, and I urge those who have the privilege to take on this responsibility not to do that because the member or the memory rather of the voters are quite long and uh, your track record is what they're going to use to hold you accountable and for them to determine whether or not they will give you the privilege again to serve for the next four years when the election comes. And it says, the next bullet point here is remember what you represent and who you represent. And so what I mean by that is, of course, you represent the community as a whole. Um, and who you represent is certainly yourself and your family, but you, you're, you're, and what I mean by that is your authenticity. Don't lose yourself and your authentic self, your authenticity, because now you're in this environment and now you feel that you have to be somebody different to be accepted. Uh, if you were brave enough to run and to go knock on doors and do a debate and the community has said, yes, you're a person that we want, there is no reason for you to move away from your authentic self. And so I would encourage those never to lose sight of who you are and what you represent. Uh, serving, and I'll say this and we'll take uh, questions, but serving is a privilege. It's not a right. Sometimes we get elected into public office and we tend to believe because we've been there for more than one term, somehow it's a right and that I deserve to be there. This is my chair, this is my spot. It's a privilege and the community gives you that privilege. And there's a right way to behave and to conduct yourself when you're in public office and there's a wrong way. And all you have to do this evening is turn on the news on CNN and see what's happening to governor, well, I should say former governor Cuomo uh, in New York uh, as to the wrong way of doing things and how that could come back to bite you when people are now looking at your track record. So uh, that concludes 
the slide on sort of the nuts and bolts. This doesn't necessarily cover everything, but it certainly gives you, um, uh, I hope, some information and some guidance as to key factors, key dates, and things to consider as you are looking at uh, whether to get into public office, whether this round or maybe the next round. But certainly, as I mentioned before, what I want to do is take the opportunity to answer any questions that any of you may have that may be more personal by way of my own experience or more general with respect to just municipal politics. So at this time, I'll turn it over back to Alethea and to the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Anderson. That was a very well-informed presentation. And I've got some notes here, so many nuggets that you shared with us, especially when it comes to, you know, the why, why are you running? And it is so critical for, you know, any potential candidate to know, you know, the reason why you're running, what is your purpose and who you represent, because you can easily get lost in the shuffle and um, lose focus and why you're in that seat. I do have um, a few questions um, that I have written down for you, but before I ask my questions and the pre-submitted questions, I'm going to turn it over to the audience because I'm, I'm sure there are some questions that are waiting to be answered. So um, are there any questions from the audience, um, perhaps Jordan or Maxime? Are you able to hear me? Perfect. Yes, yeah, we're able to hear you. Thank you. Don't be shy. Perfect. 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 Just want to know, I guess, um, on your end, if you ever saw yourself in, you know, in politics long term, did you see yourself, you know, was, was it something that, you know, you came about, um, you know, just, you know, just within life or is it something that you kind of always wanted? I'm just kind of curious to understand your initial journey and how you kind of led up to where you are today. Mm, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, no, I'd be lying if I said that, uh, uh, politics was something that I had a sort of lifelong sort of dream to be in. Um, you know, as the, the article that I referenced to about representation and seeing people like you, when I was growing up in Jane and Finch, I, I didn't see uh, a lot of politicians at that time, BIPOC politicians that necessarily would have inspired me to say that uh, this was possible. Um, but as I mentioned before about why you're running, um, usually something happens where you decide, you know what, it's time for me to step up and do something, right? Whether you think that there's inaction, it could be social reform, social justice reform. Maybe you think something is not happening in your community and you just feel like, you know what, uh, I don't think anybody else is going to do it. I'm going to have to step up and do it. And so for me, uh, that's what it was about. It was about um, election cycle after election cycle where I felt that the politicians weren't really representing my views and the things that I felt that were important to me and my community. Um, and to be, to be specific, uh, the Black community, uh, I, I'm not shy to, to, to say that. Uh, we, we all run for a particular purpose. And so instead of sitting there and complaining about woe is me and why are these individuals not doing what I think they should be doing for our community, I need to step up and see if I could get into this position to make sure that uh, a collective uh, 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 viewpoint uh, and representation is there at that level. It's either you're at the table when decisions are being made or you're reacting to decisions because you're not at the table. And so for me, it was time to pull up the chair and take a seat at the table. So that's the reason why I initially got involved into politics. I appreciate that, great answer, thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. I see we have two hands raised, but before I take the first question, I'm going to read this comment because it's quite powerful. Um, Anand posted in the chat, in my opinion, Steve has been a trailblazer in this town of Shelburne. I first met Steve when he was campaigning for deputy mayor and after talking to him and hearing his vision for our town, I realized that he was championing causes which I believed in and I had no hesitation in throwing the support of myself and my family behind him. To date, he has not disappointed. In fact, he has accomplished more than I expected. And again, this is a powerful statement and it goes again to what you stated in your, in your presentation, Deputy Mayor. Um, you need to know, you know, stay committed and know why you are running. Stay true to who you are and the people you represent. So thank you for that comment, Anand, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. I see you have your hand raised. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Loud and clear, thank Loud and you. Clear, thank you. Okay. Um, Steve, I don't intend to put you on 
spot, but I have a question for you. That being the only uh, black man on the council as the deputy mayor of the town of Shelburne, and uh, in my opinion, this being a very, I would say, redneck community prior to us migrants starting to move here. How well have you been received and embraced by the council? Mm, well, uh, uh, I, I would say, I would say well, well, um, I, I think, uh, you know, again, this goes back to the, the point that I made about your message, right? Um, that you, you can walk into an environment and I'm not saying that this is the case. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to try to fool everybody and say one size fits all. Uh, and this, you know, if you apply this mindset, they'll, they'll carry the day in any environment that you're in. Uh, I can only speak from my experience. Um, but I, I firmly believe that despite the obvious differences, um, you know, the way I was, the way I looked compared to you know, the majority of the community at the time, I really felt that if I presented a strong message to the community, that they would see past the difference. And at the end of the day, what you want people to focus on is your substance. And so uh, even though this, uh, uh, as you identified, this black man who was coming from Oakville at the time that moved to this community, uh, I got involved in the community. Uh, I was able to show people that I was community minded and I was able to show people what I was bringing to the table. And um, as you mentioned, you know, communicate a message that was real and that resonated with people. And so, and that's evidenced by the fact that I got appointed as counselor and I got elected as deputy mayor just 10 months later. And so to answer your question, I would say I've been well received. Does that mean that there are not uh, those who maybe uh, fully embraced uh, me being there? Yeah, of course, but you'll find that in every walk of life. But uh, council and the community has certainly embraced me and I've embraced them. Perfect, thank you. And then does that answer your question? Uh, yes, well, thank you very much, Steve. And um, for everyone that's listening, I just want you to know that I have, uh, I have given Steve my own um, moniker and I have nicknamed him the Barack Obama of Shelburne as he keeps breaking <laughs> down barriers. And I, 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 I am really um, excited about working with you um, when you eventually become the mayor of this town. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Anand. Thanks, Thanks for putting it out there. Put it in the universe. Um, um, our next our question next is question from is Trisha Linton. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my question, um, Councillor. Steve Anderson. So my question is, what do you see as the gaps in politics being black uh, post George Floyd? And, and in terms of um, that will help others um, being able to find, especially black people finding their what and their why in politics in the landscape of Ontario, especially in municipalities that do not have the presence of a lot of black people living there. Mm. Oh, wow, <laughs> what a question. Uh, and that's maybe a bullet point that I left off the presentation. Uh, when you get into public office, you gotta be prepared to deal with the tough questions. Uh, you can't skirt around it. And when you skirt around tough questions, people will see that. So uh, I, I welcome the tough questions um, uh, from, from anyone in our community who uh, is looking to get uh, answers that they need. So thank you for your question. So where are the gaps? I, I think what we saw um, after the murder of George Floyd is that there's a lot more work to be done, right? Um, we know that there have been a lot of community advocates out there uh, doing the work, um, but this was just another reminder of how much more work still needs to be done. I think what has happened after um, George Floyd is the community really galvanizing and saying, in what we know needs to be done, we need to step up and get out of our comfort zone and put ourselves in position where we could affect change. As I mentioned before, either you're at the decision-making table, making the change, 
or you're reacting to the change. And oftentimes when you're reacting to the change, you're usually dissatisfied. And so what I see happening after George Floyd is a lot of BIPOC individuals saying to themselves, I need to step up. And, and certainly uh, Velma from Operation Black Hope could uh, testify to this. Uh, we see a lot of candidates, if you're following her on social media, she's always uh, apt to put out those in the BIPOC community who are now running for public office, uh, putting themselves out there because they recognize that they need to be at these levels in order to affect long-term and sustainable changes. And so uh, I think many of us are doing that. We're seeing the importance of that. And even just the discussions that I've been having over the last little while, uh, as I mentioned, I did uh, uh, a presentation just the other day for some folks in Guelph, that there's a thirst where it may not have been there before, but there's certainly a thirst today to say the time is now and we can't allow it to go back to the status quo. And so uh, as, as unfortunate as the death of George Floyd was at the time, um, I could certainly say that it certainly has not been in vain just based on the activity that I see happening. Perfect, we have a couple questions that have been submitted from the chat. Um, Trish, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. The first question we have is from Ian. Could you speak to any strategies for dealing with opposition or resistance to your position, message, and or views? How did you gain support to push your message? How, how do you deal with opposition? Um, I think, uh, you know, you do the best that you can, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, there's some people, you know, the analogy I give is the, the, the vaccine. Uh, I use that as an example, a current example. Um, you could tell a number of people the virtues of the vaccine all you want, all day long. Uh, you could bring in all the doctors, have all the panels, all the experts, and there are some people who will listen to all of that and say, I don't care, I'm not going to take it. I don't support that. Uh, and it's the same thing when it comes to politics, especially when you're running, uh, is you'll bring certain virtues to the table and there will be a number of people who will embrace that. And there'll be a number of people who say, I don't subscribe to that. But at the end of the day, and that's okay, because at the end, this is a democracy. And there are people who can say, I either believe and subscribe to what you're doing or I don't. Um, but if you have the privilege to be elected, uh, that's not the time where you are pulling out your scorecard and saying, well, you know what? The, I remember these folks that didn't vote for me and so now that I'm in power, I'm going to make sure I'm settling old scores. I, I'm not a believer in that. Whether you voted for me or, or you didn't, once I'm in power or in a position of leadership, I'm making sure that I'm representing everybody equally. Uh, so the way you deal with resistance is you try to provide people with the knowledge. Uh, you allow people to take the knowledge and do as they may. But at the end of the day, you have to move forward and be prepared to govern if you're given that opportunity. Perfect, thank you, well said. Um, what is one ad advice you would give black people who are deciding to run for elected office? Uh, go for it. Um, that's, what, that's what I would say. I would say go for it. Um, don't rely on other people to do what you could do for yourself. Um, that's what I would say. Um, it, it's a challenge. Uh, it could be daunting. Um, you could feel that you're on an island by yourself because as you look to your right and look to your left, you're not seeing many people who look like you uh, that are pursuing these kinds of opportunities, but don't let that dissuade you. And, and again, this is circular, but it comes back to the same point, which is know why you're running because when things get difficult, it's that what you're going to rely on to carry you through the day. And usually if, if that why is a principled why, uh, that will allow you to help weather the storms that eventually will come your way when you're doing this. This is not an easy path or an easy road, but it's not an impossible road to travel. And certainly myself and many others, I think, have demonstrated that. That's a great, thank you. Um, a nice follow-up to that question, and you touched a bit about it on your presentation about mentors. Since there are so few um, racialized mentors, what advice or suggestions do you have to reach out and find individuals who can provide you with advice and tips and mentorship along the way? 
Uh, well, I say reach out to organizations like Operation Black Vote. Uh, they have the 1864 Fellowship Program, uh, certainly uh, the DCCBA platform. Um, and, you know, just connect with, reach out to folks uh, and, you know, do your research. That's like you would do anything else. When you're going on vacation somewhere, you're going online and you're researching the hotel, you're researching the area, you're researching the amenities that are there uh, so that when you get there, you know what to expect and that you're comfortable. Uh, and by all means, if there's an opportunity to do that, if you're looking to get into public office, do that. So know who's in your area, know who's in office. And once you find out those individuals, usually they have emails and phone numbers, you can reach out to them and, um, and uh, ask to meet or to have a copy, have a Zoom chat and uh, to tap into their experience. Now, that being said, if there is not a racialized mentor that you could get, that doesn't mean you put your party hat away and say, forget it because I can't find a black person to talk to. No, you find somebody else. And if it's a white mentor or an Asian mentor, you find a mentor, period. Uh, of course, it is uh, nice to find somebody that you feel that you could identify with that may share your, your issues and your concerns and, and are able to relate to that, no question. But usually in life, things are not handed to you on a platter like that. And so it, again, you may have to come out of your comfort zone and reach out to somebody that has the experience anyways and get what you need so that you're able to move forward. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for that question, Velma. The next question I have is from Minerva. Um, you mentioned that knowing your why is important. However, we know that even being grounded in your why as a, I'm not sure if it's radicalized or racialized person, the challenges sometimes make it difficult to remain motivated. Without enough available mentorship for black and racialized candidates, what's your advice regarding other tools one can access to stay the course? And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit in the previous um, answer. Um, what are their tools? Um, uh, again, I, I think you, you have to try to reach out to, um, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's, and I thank you for your question, Minerva. You know, this is um, for racialized candidates, uh, it, it, you know, I make no bones about it. It's difficult uh, because you may not necessarily feel comfortable reaching out to certain folks because you're fearful of how they may uh, view you, perceive you, et cetera. But this is no different than in the corporate world. The further you move up the ladder, the reality is, is the less likely you're going to see more people that look like you. Uh, but that being said, you still have to find ways to navigate in that environment and do your job and be successful. Uh, and whether that is Again, finding a mentor who may not be uh, black or Asian or whatever the case may be, uh, because there are good people of all shades. And so we shouldn't look at the fact that even though there's not that Asian mentor, that black mentor, that somehow all is lost. No, there are still good people that are out there that are prepared to take you under your wing. Uh, when I was campaigning, for example, uh, the individual that I campaigned with was uh, a gentleman named Councillor Walter Bonato. One of, uh, he's been on council for God knows how long, a number of years. And we knocked on doors together and I was with him, an, an Italian white man, I was with him and he shared, I was like a sponge and he shared everything about the community, what it was like to do and run a, success, a successful campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So even though uh, I didn't have somebody there that was black to share that same information with me, and maybe give me some insights into things that may be more specific to my experience, there was still information and support that I got from him that was tremendous in me accomplishing what I was able to accomplish. So um, are you going to have uh, necessarily everything at your fingertips? No, uh, but certainly there are individuals and there are more today than there were before that I think that you can reach out to. And like I said, organizations uh, as well that you could tap into to, um, to get that support that you need. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and ask one last question before um, we move to our close. And it is around your strategy. So when you ran, of course it was very different when you were first appointed um, counselor versus when you ran for deputy mayor. Um, what strategy did you use to manage your campaign? Uh, get uh, some good folks around you. Uh, and, and you know this, uh, uh, Alicia, you ran for school board trustee. Um, you, you can't do this by yourself. Uh, you need to have a good team of people who are around you that you trust, 
uh, that uh, believe in you, that believe in your vision, and that are able to take your vision door to door as if you were standing there in front of that person that they're knocking uh, on their door uh, to hand out your information. So surround yourself with people who uh, that you could trust, uh, and that um, and, and when when things get difficult, because they will get difficult, uh, those individuals, that tight knit core of individuals, will be there to remind you why you are doing what you're doing and that success is around the corner. Lift up your spirits when inevitably they get down because the campaign experience is long. It's several months and there's uh, peaks and valleys uh, during that campaign. There are days where you feel fantastic and there are days when you knock on the door and you don't get the response that you want and you're thinking, why am I doing this? Maybe I should just step aside. Uh, so having a team around you that understands you, that understands the process, uh, and is there to inspire you every step of the way, uh, I think is really crucial. Uh, so get a team around you that is prepared to support you during the process. Perfect. I see a last um, question came in through the chat. Um, if you are not able to at the municipal level, what other ways can we be supportive or par participate in the cause? Are there other roles outside of the political stadium? Well, I mean, if you're not gonna run for office, you can certainly vote. Um, that, that's, one, that's a great way to get involved in the political process and make sure that your voice uh, is heard. Um, uh, of course, I mean, you can get involved in your community. Uh, there's a number of organizations, uh, again, another shameless plug for DCTBA or, or Operation Black Votes and many others that are out there uh, where you can get involved in your community uh, and take on causes. Not everybody has to be in public office to make a difference. Uh, there are roles in many different areas in our community that you could uh, be involved in um, where your contribution, your ideas, and your support will go a long way in making a difference. So I would just say, you know, if you're, if you're passionate about community, uh, look for those opportunities, uh, whether they're volunteer or otherwise, uh, because they're just as important as those who may be in front of the cameras in public office. We need people at different levels. Uh, we can't just be top heavy. We need people at the grassroots level. We need people at the sort of uh, ground floor level. And we need people who may be in politics in, in other spheres as well to be able to influence changes at that level as well. So uh, I think there are many ways to get involved. You just have to sort of narrow down what you think your skill set is and, uh, and, and find out is there an organization or a company or whatever it may be that aligns with your values that may give you an opportunity to uh, put forward what you believe that you need to put forward. Perfect, that's a great answer. And you know, to add to that, if you don't want to run for office, you can always support your candidate that you believe in a number of ways. You can door knock, you can you know, put up a sign, you can rally the community around to make sure that everyone goes out and, and votes for whoever their candidate is. Um, Minerva, sorry, Velma actually put a response in the chat. Can you um, expand on that, Velma? Um, your response is to apply for government ABC. I'm not sure everyone knows what ABC is. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, I could have responded. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. So AG, uh, ABCs are agencies, boards, and commissions, and their arms lends to different levels of government. And I know, for instance, the province of Ontario have over 350 agencies, boards, and commissions. Uh, some of them, you, some of them are salaries. So your vice chair, or chair, you, you get a salary, so it's your job. Others is a per diem and travel, so you may meet three or four times a year, and so you get paid to come in from wherever you are across the province. It's usually in Toronto, and you get paid for it. But you basically you 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 make decisions that inform government policy. So you can. Um, you could participate in that that forum. There are tons of ABCs. Um, if you're a lawyer, you know there's ABCs for your skill set. If you're a teacher, there's ABCs for your skill set. Any type of skill set you have, there is an ABC at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels for those. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, that's a great uh, point, uh, Velma, that you raised because as 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 um, Alicia was reading out uh, my bio, uh, I served on the College of Kinesiology. That was a provincial. Uh, appointment. So thanks for that uh, reminder. That was a provincial appointment. Uh, there you get you get great governance skills and you have an opportunity to impact. I had an opportunity to impact that profession because there I was at the decision making table um, when important decisions were being made. 
Uh, and so, yes, whether it's the police services board, uh, whether it's hydro, um, whether it's, you know, community care access center, there's a number of different agencies where you could apply right from, uh, right now, I actually serve with, uh, at the federal level with Defense Construction Canada, um, where we do work on the behalf of the Canadian Armed Forces. And so, as, as Velma pointed out, there's a myriad of different ways, certainly those agencies per diem, salary or otherwise, that you could look into. All you have to do is do a, a quick Google search, uh, whether it's the public secretariat or otherwise, and uh, you can consider those opportunities as well. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as we're wrapping up our session, I'm gonna invite everyone to put your comments, your feedback about tonight's session in the chat. Um, our next session will be September 7th and that will be on a tax planning. So stay tuned for um, the Eventbrite and um, Facebook um, notifications uh, for that session. Um, before I officially close, um, and Tabot, I saw that you jumped on camera earlier. I'm not sure if you had a question or if you just wanted to show us your lovely face. Yep, you just summed it right up. Perfect, okay, well, thank you for your support and for coming out. Um, before I close, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson. I actually um, mentioned at the beginning of um, the session as part of his bio that he has an upcoming book uh, soon to be released. So I would like to hear a little bit more about that book and perhaps the timing for the, uh, the release of the book. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I mean, the, the book is called Driven to Succeed. Uh, and this has been uh, a labor of love, I, I tell you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's taken a while to get to this point. Uh, this is the first autobiography that I've released. Uh, there it is. Um, and I'm hoping before the end of this month, I would say probably the next week or two, you should look out for a press release. Uh, the book will be available through my website for purchase on Amazon. Um, and you know whether it's in our local library, et cetera, for those who are in Dufferin County, you'll certainly be able to access it uh, through a number of different avenues or forums uh, there as well. But this story um, really chronicles my journey, again, growing up uh, in Jane Finch to becoming the first black lawyer at the TTC, uh, the first black lawyer, first black individual appointed as counselor, and of course, the first black deputy mayor. And, and, and what it is meant to do is really uh, inspire mainly our youth to say that it doesn't matter where you start, it's how you decide to finish. Uh, it, you know, obstacles in life are inevitable, but that's not a reason not to succeed. And so again, this story here, I hope is to resonate with our youth, certainly anybody, but uh, the target audience certainly is our youth to let them know that again, that you could grow up in Jane and Finch, Rexdale or any other area where it may not necessarily be ideal in the eyes of the community uh, or those who look down in those areas, um, but good things can come uh, even from modesty or from humble beginnings. And so, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to put that story together to share it with our community. And uh, I, I look forward to doing that. So thanks for, for allowing me to speak briefly on that, but I'll certainly, I'm sure Alethea and, and others will be sharing that. Um, and I'd be happy to get your feedback from any uh, individual who uh, uh, comes across it. Uh, I'd love to hear back from you as to what your, what your thoughts are. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I am looking forward to my signed copy, and I believe Alma <laughs> is looking forward to her signed copy as well. So <laughs> can't wait. Um, again, everyone, thank you so much for coming out again tonight. Um, please feel free to um, keep your comments going in the chat. Um, we do make note of these comments, and we actually catalog these, and uh, we share these with our sponsors um, as well when we are applying for grants, funding, um, etc. So your comments definitely go a long way in helping us to put on these amazing events. Um, if you haven't already yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, I encourage you to do that. You can also um, watch all of our previous Ask Our Expert episodes. Um, and finally, um, we do have our merchandise store that is available on our website. So please feel free to um, purchase your DCCBA swag. Again, Purchase um, will go towards putting on events and programs, most notably the scholarship um, awards program. And we just celebrated our one year um, scholarship awards ceremony earlier this last week, actually, where we were able to award a number of students um, scholarships. So 
again, your when you participate in DCCBA, when you purchase swag, when you donate, the money goes towards a good cause. So um, I encourage everyone to continue to go out and support in any way you can. And of course, participate in these events. So thank you once again for your time. And I look forward to seeing everyone again on September 7th. Yeah, and just before you close, Anderson. Elisa, I just want to say thanks to the people who uh, put those kind words in, in the uh, the chat. Uh, I just want to give a special shout out to uh, Lanerick. Uh, I, I see your comments, Lanerick. I appreciate uh, you joining. Uh, this is a good brother that's doing some excellent work in the Toronto Danforth area. So thanks, Lanerick, for, for joining this evening. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So feel free to network if you guys want. I'm going to stop recording.